all moving objects have momentum. The amount of momentum an object has is directly dependent on the mass and velocity of the object. This means that objects that are very massive and have large velocities will have a large momentum. Consider the situation of trying to catch a baseball compared to a bowling ball moving at the same velocity. Because the mass of the baseball is much less than the bowling ball, it is much easier to slow down and catch than it would be a bowling ball moving at the same velocity. In this example, we say the bowling ball has greater momentum than the baseball because its mass is greater. To calculate the momentum of either object, you would find the product of the mass and velocity of the object. Importantly, momentum is a vector quantity, and the velocity not only contributes to the magnitude of the momentum, but it also is the indicator of the direction of the momentum. Importantly, if the mass or the velocity change, then the momentum changes. This is important because if we consider Newton's second law, any object undergoing an acceleration also has a changing momentum due to the change in the velocity of the object. This means that a net force leads to a change in momentum. Objects interact by crashing into one another. These interactions are called collisions. When objects collide, they transfer momentum. Any interaction where momentum is transferred or shared between moving objects is a collision. Consider a game of billiards. The goal of billiards is to use your cue ball to collide with other billiard balls and cause them to sink into the pockets. In order to get these billiard balls to move at the correct velocity, the transfer of momentum between the cue ball and its target must be considered. If the cue ball is struck with a large force, the cue ball will accelerate and gain a large amount of momentum. That momentum will then be transferred to its target billiard ball causing the ball that was hit to accelerate. The amount of momentum originally given to the cue ball determines how much momentum will be transferred to the target ball. A large amount of momentum originally will cause a large transfer of momentum to the target ball. The collision between objects can be interpreted as either a change in momentum or as an effect of forces between two objects. To show the link between these ideas, the quantity of impulse is important to be aware of. Impulse is the product of force and time, and is the change in momentum. To understand impulse, we must go back to Newton's second law, which says F is equal to ma. If we substitute the acceleration term for the change in velocity over time, v minus u over t, that we learned in kinematics, then we get the equation mass times the quantity v minus u divided by time. This portion of the equation mass times the quantity v minus u is also the change in momentum of the object and therefore we can say force is equal to the change in momentum over time. This now links force and momentum together and if we make one more rearrangement of the equation we can see that the change in momentum is dependent on the force and time. This means that to change the momentum of an object, it is the amount of force exerted on an object over a period of time. This is impulse. Take into consideration when a car breaks down and must be pushed to a safe location. A car is very massive and with a force of a few people, it can be accelerated. However, in order to accelerate the car, the force must be applied for a long period of time. This shows the idea of impulse in action. Even though the force from the people may be minimal in comparison to the mass of the vehicle, given enough time, the car will accelerate. In our discussion of impulse, we assume that the force exerted is constant. That, however, is not always the reality, and the amount of force can vary over time. Therefore, a force time graph can give us insight into how force over time impacts the change in momentum of an object. Using the impulse equation, we know that force times the change in time will equal the change in momentum. Therefore, on a force time graph, finding the area under the curve will allow you to find the change in momentum. Let's take a look at the example of force being steadily increased on an object, reaching a max, and then steadily decreases. This would result in a force time graph that looks a lot like a triangle. 
To then find the change in momentum of the object, a calculation is made using the area of the triangle and the values from the graph. In this case, the calculation is one half the max force times the change in time. As we have learned, Newton's third law states that for every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. During collisions, objects abide by this law and thus in a collision between two objects, the impulse imparted from object A onto object B is equal and opposite to the impulse imparted from object B onto object A. Since the impulse is the change in momentum of the object and that the value is the same but opposite for objects A and B, then both objects will have the same change in momentum. The result of this same change in momentum for each object is that the total momentum in the whole system remains constant when there is no external force acting on the system. This is known as the principle of conservation of linear momentum. In all types of collisions, the principle of conservation of linear momentum always holds true. There are two types of collisions to be aware of. Elastic collisions are collisions in which no energy is lost. To illustrate this form of a collision, we can use a Newton's cradle as an example. In a Newton's cradle, the objects are falling and striking each other, causing collisions and a transfer of momentum between all of the objects. In an elastic collision, there is no energy loss and these objects would continue to move back and forth, transferring momentum forever. However, this is in an idealized world where no energy is lost to sound or heat or friction or deformation of material. In a more real world setting, the objects would eventually slow down over time due to the loss in energy. We call these collisions where energy is lost as inelastic collisions. When evaluating situations, it is important to be aware of which type of collision is occurring since a loss of energy would result in a changing velocity and thus a change in momentum of the objects. When an object moves in circles at a constant speed, we consider the object to be undergoing uniform circular motion. An important distinction about this motion is that the object does not have a constant velocity, but a constant speed. Remember, velocity has a magnitude and a direction. Because of the nature of circular motion, the object is constantly changing its direction. Therefore, the velocity is always changing. Since the velocity is changing, we now consider all objects undergoing uniform circular motion as accelerating. When objects undergo circular motion, our understanding of motion must be changed from linear understanding to circular understanding. Let's compare the two forms. In linear motion, we learn that the velocity of an object is dependent on the displacement of the object in a straight line and the time it took for the object to reach that point. In circular motion, we need to understand that the speed of the object is dependent on the angular displacement and the time it takes for the object to cover that displacement. The angular displacement is the angle through which an object moves its circular motion and it is measured in either degrees or radians. Most commonly it will be measured in radians. The speed or the velocity of an object in circular motion is measured as the angular speed which is the angular displacement divided by the time for the angular displacement to take place. This is really measuring how quickly is the object moving across a certain angular distance. Angular speed is measured as either degrees per second or radians per second and is represented by the Greek letter omega. When considering circular motion, the measurement of time is also redefined. Period, also known as periodic time, is the time it takes for an object to complete one circle of its motion and it is represented by the capital letter T. Because the object is traveling in a circle, we can define the distance traveled by the object as the angular displacement of the whole circle. This value would be 2 times pi, since the angular measurement in radians of a full circle is 2 pi. Much like our understanding from kinematics, if you know the distance traveled and the speed at which you travel, you can define the time by those measurements as time is equal to the distance divided by the speed. 
Here we are doing something similar by defining the period or time to complete one rotation by the angular displacement of the full circle and dividing that by the angular speed which we defined previously as omega. Another quantity to be familiar with in regards to the circular motion is frequency. In this case, the frequency is the measurement of the number of times an object goes around a circle in a unit time. In most cases, it is the number of rotations per second. This is known as Hertz, named after physicist Heinrich Hertz. There is a link between frequency and period which says the period is equal to 1 over the frequency. And if you replace period in terms of angular speed, we can define the angular speed as 2 times pi times the frequency. In some situations, you may want to know the linear speed of an object going through circular motion. Understanding the connection between angular speed and linear speed becomes essential. To understand the link between linear and angular speed, you must treat the circumference of the circle as the linear distance. The circumference of a circle is 2 times pi times the radius of the circle. Since the period is the time it takes to complete one circle, then the linear speed can be solved for by saying the distance of the circular path, 2 times pi times the radius r, divided by the time it takes to travel that path, which is the period t. Now, you can rearrange this equation and solve it in terms of the period t, and then set that equal to the period equation in terms of the angular speed. And this results in 2 times pi times r divided by the linear speed v is equal to 2 times pi divided by the angular speed. If you then cancel out the 2 times pi on both sides of the equation, we see that the linear speed is equal to the angular speed times the radius of the circle. Newton's first law tells us that an external outside force must be present in order to change the velocity of an object. Since we have already covered that in circular motion the velocity is changing due to the constant change in the direction of the object, it must mean that there is an external force applied to the object to cause this change to occur. The force causing this change to occur is called the centripetal force and it causes centripetal acceleration. The centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle of which the object is moving, and the centripetal acceleration is always at 90 degrees to the velocity vector. The centripetal acceleration can be found in multiple ways, some of which use the linear speed of the object and others use the angular speed. When solving problems, be aware of which form of speed you are using to solve the problem. In the case of centripetal force, we must remember Newton's second law, which says that the force causing the acceleration is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. In the case of circular motion, the centripetal force can then be defined as the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Importantly, the type of force providing the centripetal force is important. For example, in the case of an object like the moon orbiting Earth, the force causing the centripetal force is the force of gravity. However, in the case of a ball being swung around attached to a string, the force causing the centripetal force is the tension force. In both cases, the direction of the force is acting between the object and towards the center of the circle. 